Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk to you this evening about our excavations at the Dorsey, uh, specifically our uh, 2019 excavations, which were so kindly uh, funded by the Ring of Gullion Landscape Partnerships, but also uh, our earlier excavations uh, in 2002 and our previous uh, investigations at the Dorsey and also uh, on the Black Pig Stake uh, and the Linear Earthworks of, of Ireland more generally. Um, the Dorsey, as I'm sure many of you know, is uh, a very unusual, uh, almost uh, unique uh, monument. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very large earthwork. It measures the best part of two kilometres, so northeast to southwest, 1.8 kilometres. And it's about uh, 500 metres uh, uh, north, north to south. So it's very large. It's, it's roughly sort of a, a kidney shaped. Uh, and it's defined for at least part of its length by some very large and impressive uh, earthworks. Um, we can see here on the, the first edition uh, Ordnance Survey uh, from the 1830s uh, a depiction of the, the banks as, the, as they were seen by the, uh, uh, the, the map makers at the time. And you can see that the banks look very well defined. You can, you can see uh, on the right hand side where uh, hopefully my mouse, yes the arrow is, you can see here where the Bonds Road uh, runs through the earthworks and you can see that what we still have is the, is the modern well-defined earthworks at the Bonds Road uh, were well-defined and prominent and larger than most of the rest of the monument uh, at that time also and uh, it was it was a, a set of several earthworks not just one earthwork. Similarly in the, uh, the south uh, uh, west of the monument at the Dromal Bridge area, uh, down close to the Standing Stone, the White Stone of Watching, uh, there was also uh, a, a large, uh, well-defined uh, multiple bank and, and, and ditch structure. Uh, and uh, the, the rest of the monument seems to be reasonably intact according to uh, the first edition Ordnance Survey map makers. Now John Donaldson, the uh, early archaeologist, uh, and Aquarian uh, linguist uh, who was uh, of course uh, with the Ordnance Survey was slightly uh, sceptical about some of this first edition uh, depiction of the, the, the Dorsey. He believed that they had joined some of the dots together to make a more complete uh, monument than there really was even in the 1830s and there's been a, a debate generally about the Dorsey and other uh, linear earthworks as to how uh, much you could take the stretches that survive today and make them into sort of comprehensive sort of long uh, 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 earthworks or, 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 or archaeological monuments and how much that's just uh, hopeful uh, joining of the dots uh, uh, joining the gaps between them to make a whole that there never really was in the first place and that's been a sort of an ongoing sort of debate within archaeology really since the, the time of the first edition uh, Ordnance Survey in which uh, as I'll discuss it in a few minutes modern survey techniques uh, might have cast some uh, light upon. This is a second edition sort of 18 uh, 60s map of the Dorsey and you can see in the 1860s they're depicting something quite a lot more like what we see today. Uh, there is the, the, the well-defined stretch uh, at uh, the Bonds Road, there is the well-defined uh, section also at Jamal Bridge, uh, there, are, there is running roughly along the line of the Dorsey uh, some field boundaries, uh, which which we can still see today, and are you know quite substantial field boundaries, but for a lot of the Dorsey, there really are, it's just this dotted line, and that probably says quite a lot uh, about what well, it, it it says everything really about what the map makers in the 1860s found when they got onto the ground. They found a monument which didn't really exist, or which was at least difficult to trace uh, for most of its uh, of its uh, perimeter. And this also feeds into this idea that, in fact, the Dorsey was never really uh, as complete an enclosure as the first map makers uh, suggested. Uh, and by the third edition maps, while it still says ancient entrenchment, you'll notice it says site of ancient entrenchment, and only the two uh, best surviving sections of the Dorsey are depicted at all. The rest is left completely uh, to the imagination. Uh, this is an aerial photograph just showing the uh, 
the, the, the Bonds Road area today. Uh, you can see McAllister's house, which is the site where we dug in 2002, just here, uh, quite close to the centre. You can see that, the, well, you can't really see the, the, the earthworks very well because uh, they're covered in trees, but they're so, they're so substantial that you can actually kind of really get an idea of the fact that there, there are earthworks in there. You can sort of almost see the linearity of them uh, de delineated uh, in the trees. Interestingly, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, there were some surveys done of these, uh, and uh, it seems that there has been a certain amount of infill. Uh, since then, the, 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 the maximum distance by my estimation from uh, the, 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 the top of the, the bank to the bottom of the deepest ditch in this area is about 7 metres and it was estimated as well 10, 11 metres, 10, I think 10 or 11 yards uh, by Cain uh, and by Letts in sort of late Victorian and Edwardian periods. So it might have been that there's been a certain amount of infill uh, since then or perhaps their measurements weren't perfectly accurate but I, I doubt that because they were very well done. Uh, but um, you can get an idea of the scale of the earthworks at this uh, position. I mean, they're substantial. They're several several hundred metres of really impressive uh, bank and ditch. When you drive up towards this, as many of you will know, you know you see uh, you know a, a, a huge sort of a wall almost in front of you as you drive up the Bonds Road, uh, going through this uh, narrow gap. But it's a narrow gap which we know, and I'll talk about this in a minute or two. We know to be an original gap. It's not as if this was a continuous monument which the Bonds Road was forced through. No, this is, uh, was always a discontinuous monument. There was always a gap of a few metres at this point to allow access from one side of the Dorsey to the other side of the Dorsey. And this ties in with the whole uh, concept of the, the, the meaning of the name Dorsey, which of course Dorsey, doors or, or, or gates uh, in, uh, in Irish. And, uh, question of course is whether that's a later uh, interpretation put onto the earthworks or whether this was the, the original intention and meaning and significance of the earthworks at the time of their uh, construction. This is an aerial photograph of uh, the Dromal Bridge earthworks and interestingly the Dromal Bridge earthworks also have uh, a gap in them but uh, there hasn't been as much excavation. There's always been a bit of excavation actually carried at this end but it didn't specifically target the gap and uh, we don't know for sure if this gap is an original gap or whether it's a gap that's been forced through at a later stage for some agricultural uh, purpose or other. Uh, one of the great advances in recent years uh, for archaeology has been LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR, for want of a better word, it's, 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 it's uh, radar with light, basically, La laser radar. It fires beams uh, at uh, targets. Uh, laser beams at targets and the beams bounce back and from the, 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 the time it takes the, the beam to leave the laser to get to the target and back again you can estimate the distance, you can estimate the elevation, you can do all sorts of things. And millions of these beams are fired off during a LIDAR survey, billions for a large LIDAR survey, and they build up a potentially extremely accurate reconstruction of the landscape. This is a LIDAR survey which was conditioned or commissioned by the then Northern Ireland Environment Agency, now the Historic Environment Division, and uh, the data is freely available uh, through the Open Data uh, Service. Uh, and uh, uh, this LIDAR survey is a very good, very high resolution. It's something like 12.5 uh, centimetre resolution, which is, you know, potential to pick up. Uh, really uh, small uh, details and wonderfully detailed to textured picture of the landscape. LIDAR also has the advantage of being able to an extent anyway to cut through uh, undergrowth uh, and that's you know, on, on top of everything else is, is a wonderful addition to its abilities. Even if you've quite dense a tree cover, if you fire you know, a million uh, laser uh, shots off at the ground surface, uh, a certain number of them are going to be able to make their way through the tree canopy and bounce back. And the LiDAR instrumentation is so sensitive that it can actually tell the difference in time between a, a, a laser beam which bounces off a leaf and a laser beam which makes it down the whole way to the ground. So they can subtract, effectively, uh, the undergrowth. The, the away from the actual the ground laser, uh, so the ground uh, 
the ground laser returns uh, and, and to get a, a reasonably accurate, reasonably decent survey of earthworks that are even covered uh, by trees, which uh, we, we, we managed to get from processing this uh, LIDAR data supplied by uh, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Uh, and you can see uh, the, 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 the line of the earthworks here very clearly. You can see the two banks and the, the ditches uh, very clearly on both sides uh, of the road. Uh, up to the, the Bonds Road area. And just a reminder of how this looks like on the second edition map uh, with the Bonds Road uh, going through the earthworks and the earthworks survey there. Uh, nowadays, you know, rather than having to take out a, a tape measure uh, or a, a theodolite, a uh, plane table, you can do it all from the comfort of your uh, computer after a, a, a drone or an aircraft has flown over and taken uh, LIDAR, millions and billions of uh, LIDAR uh, pieces of information. This is the Jamal Bridge area, LIDAR, showing the same sort of thing. And you can see very clearly the uh, the, the, the banks and uh, ditches uh, shown here by the LIDAR. And it's possible to use this to take uh, actually cross sections and things like that across them, make all sorts of measurements which are just as accurate as what you're going to do on the ground. Uh, what I would like actually to do, just going back here for a second or two, now these are at quite a high scale. I could zoom in uh, quite a lot more on this, uh, but uh, I, I, you know, the, I, I don't, I don't want to be here for three hours. You just go through the lidar, but uh, when you look at the lidar in detail, it's really, really interesting because, of course, from the time of John O'Donnell onwards, uh, people have been saying. Uh, was the Dorsey ever really a complete monument? Did it ever really go the whole way around? Well, the LIDAR reveals it pretty much did, actually. Um, the Dorsey was a complete unitary monument with no or at least very few uh, gaps in it. Uh, if we look here, uh, I'm just going to go to the Bonds Road. You can see the mouse. If you follow the earthworks here and go around uh, the Umri Calm River, You'll notice that there's a shadow in the landscape running up like this. And I've taken sections across this. It's basically a, uh, it's basically the, the remnants of a bank and ditch, and it is in fact the north uh, eastern uh, side of the Dorsey, which is now essentially invisible on the ground. It's also invisible from aerial photographs, but it is visible on uh, uh, the lidar survey. Uh, it's uh, you can take the, the, I, I, I can take uh, photographs from different uh, if you like images if you like from different uh, simulated light directions which show this up in different ways and I say you can measure sections across it virtually so you can see this is what was dotted on essentially on the second edition ordnance map and is also drawn on a solid in the first edition ordnance survey map is present here in the lidar well, that's actually I think quite remarkable. Also, if you go over here, just before Jamal Bridge, you can see some earthworks again, sort of a bank, two ditches possibly, uh, running through here. Possible little hint of an earthwork here. These are actually clearer if you zoom up on them. And there's some sort of a track going right through this rough area of alternately boggy and rocky land that's uh, in the centre of the Dorsey. Something as originally it went right through here to join up with these well they're 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 field, they're enhanced field boundaries now but you can see they've got a bank and ditch form and of course crystalline excavated up here so we were never in any doubt that the Dorsey survived in this area. But there you can see just from this uh, fairly zoomed out uh, LIDAR image of the eastern side of the Dorsey that certainly the eastern side of the Dorsey is fairly intact or well it's filled in but you can see the, the, the trace of it still through the lidar and if you move down to the eastern side you can see there's the Dromal bridge area there's the bit that survives well you'll have to trust me it's not actually so visible on this one because the with lidar it's easiest when you uh, sort of flick between two different images to see uh, the shadow of the, the, the sun from two different directions because one part of an earthwork will show up really well 
uh, when there's uh, a light from one direction, but another part of the earthwork mightn't show up so well in this used light from another direction. But you'll have to trust me that it's actually quite easy from some lighting uh, to see that the, the, the Dorsey continue around here. And, but you can still see in this picture, it's definitely present here. And it runs to at least this point. And uh, so we, are, we, we roughly have the Dorsey at least around sort of nine tenths of its circumference. And actually, I'm pretty confident you can trace it running through here too when you look at uh, some different imagery as well. So the Dorsey does look to, to be, while a monument which has been largely filled in, a monument which was at one stage intact. And of course, we also have this running off here, which as Chris Lynn suggested from his excavations in the 1970s, is probably a bit of the black pig stake coming in and joining it uh, from the uh, from from the west. Just a reminder of what it's uh, supposed to look like, according to the uh, first edition or second edition, sorry, Ordnance Survey, and that what we what we can see looks pretty much like that on, on the ground, or from the lidar rather. Uh, lovely photo here, uh, young Phil Barrett and Jill Plunkett uh, with uh, Sam Burns uh, who gave us a fantastic tour of the Dorsey one day in uh, 2002 and we're standing here at the White Stone of Watching and this is one of the interesting uh, features that's inside the Dorsey. Uh, one of the few things that you can really point to inside the Dorsey and say this is absolutely certain archaeology without uh, going and digging it. And there's all sorts of folklore uh, associated with this. Uh, and uh, it's got two or three different names, of course, White Stone of Watching, Klocha Meher, uh, different, different names. Klocha Meher might mean the Stone of the Churn, uh, and it does kind of look a bit like a churn, you can imagine. Uh, 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 so someone sort of standing there, sort of churning at, th at that quite quite easily, uh, and there there are all sorts of stories about how the stone ended up there, where it was cast from, and one thing and another. But uh, hard 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 to necessarily tie into a, con a coherent narrative uh, of the Dorsey without uh, going into great detail about the various different types of folklore, and of course the stories tend to be a little bit contradictory. Uh, I mentioned there a moment ago uh, the Black Pig Stake. Uh, the Black Pig Stake and its uh, close cousin, if you like, the Dane's Cast, are, uh, well, they're earthworks, that's probably the best way to describe them, linear earthworks, which are found in the southern bits of Ulster, and also to a certain extent extending into uh, the Midlands. Uh, Cain, uh, writing in the early 20th century, uh, suggested that these were sort of a probable frontier uh, for ancient Ulster. Uh, Cian was certainly influenced by the, the, the politics of the early 20th century. He had started off his life as a sort of a, uh, 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 a, a nationalist, I suppose, but as he had grown older, had become more convinced of the benefits of union, and then started to advocate, uh, I think, partition. And he saw uh, this as some sort of ancient border for, uh, well, it hadn't yet become Northern Ireland, but what was going to become uh, later on Northern Ireland, or at least a, a border for Ulster. Uh, many archaeologists have seen merit in what he, said, what, he, what he said, because the most of these stretches of the Black Pig State, the, 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 the earthworks, do appear to make sense if you're standing from the, the north, if you like, looking south, but others have thought he was very wrong. And the reason that most, and most recently, uh, Colleen O'Driscoll and Aidan Walsh, who have published their excavations at Scotstown in a very, very interesting volume about the Black Pig Stake and more, more generally about linear earthworks. But uh, they, 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 they believe that the real problem with the, uh, the Black Pig Stake. Uh, as a, as, as, a, as a boundary, as a, as, as a provincial boundary or a border. Uh, the problem with it is that it's discontinuous uh, and it's very discontinuous. And they believed, excuse me, that uh, all the schemes which attempted to sort of join the dots are kind of like Rorschach diagrams really, you know, where you sort of, you sort of join them and you somehow make a frontier out of them. And, and Cain probably didn't do his own idea any favours by some of the really complex schemes that he came up with. You can see just one of them here uh, for multiple sort of lines of defence for Ulster as Ulster expanded and contracted through ancient times. 
and uh, so it's led to a, a number of, of, of authors, uh, not just the Driscoll and Woods, but others as well, dismissing the possibility of this being any sort of a provincial boundary. Uh, personally, I'm a little bit agnostic about it. I can see the attractions of the idea. We do know there was an ancient Ulster. Uh, and we do know that in some respects the provinces went through this sort of competitive uh, copying of each other, what archaeologists describe as peer polity interaction. And the idea that, uh, that Ulster and other provinces might have started to physically define themselves does not seem at all unreasonable. Uh, we do know that there are earthworks in other parts of the world. Uh, and we also know that, that, that military experts from continental Europe and the Roman experts and stuff that got talked about how these earthworks while they were used militarily, were not particularly militarily useful because they were they, you know, they were so long they would require tens of thousands of soldiers to, to guard them. But they were used in continental Europe, uh, earthworks like this, as, uh, as, as dividing lines in the landscape. So it isn't impossible that they are. But the big problem, again, is that the, the breaks within the, uh, within the landscape that have to be joined together to sort of make a coherent boundary. Uh, the one thing that personally makes me think there might just be uh, provincial boundaries or that the idea has really some legs is this reference from the Second Battle of Moitura, uh, which is roughly 9th century. And it, it, it mentions that the, the Dagda, uh, and you know, going about his Dagda work being the Dagda, sort of big, big, big stout, jolly sort of godlike creep fellow. And, uh, but it mentions that uh, his giant club, which they call a wheeled fork here, uh, which which was absolutely enormous and took many men to move, that its track was enough for the boundary ditch of a province. And that certainly shows that in the 9th century AD, people conceived that it was quite appropriate to have, in fact, maybe the expectation to have uh, provincial boundary ditches. Uh, and if the, the, the Danes cast isn't, uh, and, and the, sorry, Danes cast and the Black Pig's Dyke aren't provincial boundary ditches, well, you know, I would like someone to point me to a better candidate in Ireland. There are other candidates actually, but there are none better than the, the Black Pig's Dyke, uh, really. So the idea, I think the idea still needs to be, uh, needs further investigation, and it really needs a comprehensive LIDAR surveys. Uh, there has been a certain amount of that done. Colleen O'Driscoll and Aidan Walsh have been looking at this, and they have done geophysical surveys and bits of the Black Pig's Dyke, and they've excavated uh, where they, for instance, found a Bronze Age settlement that was str straddling, or straddled by, was that the right term? Uh, the Black Pig's Dyke may be underlying it. Uh, uh, they've done quite a lot of work and they've got commissioned some LIDAR themselves, but we really need intensive LIDAR surveys of Southern Ulster. We really need LIDAR of the whole of Ireland, to be honest with you, North and South, uh, to answer a plethora, thousands of archaeological questions. Uh, but this is the sort of thing that it's very good at doing. And I suspect that if we had LIDAR of Southern Ulster the way that we now have LIDAR of the Dorsey, we would be able to pick out uh, areas of uh, bank and ditch which have been eroded and filled in for various different reasons uh, all, all along the, 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 the route of the, the Black Pig Stake uh, from east to west. Uh, these are a couple of... Uh, uh, sections that were taken through the Black Pig's Dyke by, by Keane. And you'd see a, a, an existing photograph today of the Black Pig's Dyke quite close up to uh, the Dorsey. Uh, other things that look a bit like the Dorsey. Uh, the Dorsey, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of unique. It's almost unique. There's, there, there are really only a, a couple of things in Ireland that look very much like it at all. This is probably the thing that looks most like it, uh, and it's by no means exactly the same. But it's a place called the Dune of Drumsna, and the Dune of Drumsna is just about in Roscommon. Uh, it's on the River Shannon, and it is sometimes thought of as some sort of an entry point into, into, into Connacht in the manner that uh, the Dorsey may have been an entry point uh, into Ulster. Uh, there, ha there, there has been uh, quite a lot of work done there, there have been geophysical surveys, there have been some excavation. It does seem to be broadly contemporary with uh, the Dorsey, it's certainly that point in the Iron Age, you know, a couple of centuries either side of the birth of Christ. It's in that ballpark that the, the Dorsey's in. Uh, it uh, also has got very significant earthworks. The earthworks here are along, along here, if you follow my... Uh, 
followed by Bouse. You can probably see them here. The rest of the line of the Dunedrum Snaw is thankfully defined, for, for to save all that hard work to, to the earthwork makers, uh, by the river by the river Shannon. Uh, here's a, 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 a lidar a image commissioned by O'Driscoll and uh, Walsh as part of their uh, Black Pigs Dyke sort of modern regional project. Uh, and you can see there's a very significant earthwork. And just like the Dorsey, it has two apparently uh, original uh, gaps in it. Now the O'Connors refortified this in the 12th, 11th, 12th century. Uh, it, I mean, it's it's always possible that some of this is O'Connor reworking. I mean, they were not just provincial kings; they were at times they were more or less effective kings of the whole of the country, almost anyway. So they have very considerable resources. So it's always possible that some of this is later. But there has been excavation done uh, here in in, in the uh, in the Dunedrum Snaw, which definitely shows that there was activity here going on in the Iron Age at approximately the same time as the Dorsey. So it's the best candidate uh, for something uh, a bit similar uh, to the Dorsey. Uh, excavations in the Dorsey. Uh, there have been a number of excavations carried out in the Dorsey. They have told us a lot, but the Dorsey is a huge monument, uh, an enormous monument. And really, you know, we, 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 all of them, or nearly all of the excavations have been targeted at the exterior bits of the Dorsey, the banks around the Dorsey, or close to them. We really need to look a lot more intensively at the Dorsey interior if we're going to answer some of the questions, which uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to talk about in a little while, about the possible functions of the Dorsey and its relationships to provincial territories, roads, other sites, uh, etc, etc. Uh, Oliver Davies did quite a lot of excavation of the Dorsey in the uh, 19 in the 1930s uh, and 40s and uh, uh, Chris Lynn also then followed that up with a, a number of excavations in the 1970s and uh, then there were the two Queens, well Queens NIA and then Queens uh, Ring of Gullion Landscape Partnership excavations in 2002 and uh, 2019. Uh, I'm sort of slightly talking these out of sequence uh, but uh, uh, Chris Lynn uh, did a very interesting excavation uh, on the north uh, east section of the Dorsey, quite close to Sam Burns's house. He put a section through. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to finish the excavation because the ditch was flooding more quickly than he could get it pumped out, which is always a problem when the, the, the water level, the water table is, is high. And, uh, but he did nevertheless manage to find uh, a ditch, uh, an impressive enough ditch. He found a bank, uh, he found gullies uh, behind the bank, and he also found some uh, charred material trapped in the bank, some wood uh, in the bank. And he was able to get a series of uh, radiocarbon dates. Uh, and the radiocarbon dates uh, were, well, were, were in the, sort of the, the, the late centuries BC, sort of uh, 4th to 2nd centuries BC from the radiocarbon dates. And he, also, he, he, got, he got some timbers from the, the North Ditch also, uh, which uh, were dated and dendrochronologically to about uh, 130, 140 BC. Uh, dendrochronology uh, can, in certain circumstances, be accurate to within the year, uh, and even when it's not accurate within the year, if you if you know that you're dealing with the outer layers of wood, uh, you can be accurate to within a few years. You know, typically plus or minus six or plus or minus twelve years or something like that. So it's an excellent dating method. So it really did establish uh, the for the for the first time properly uh, the Iron Age date of the the Dorsey. Uh, he also uh, excavated in uh, the southwest of the monument, uh, where uh, some sort of agricultural work had revealed a series of oak posts uh, in the palisade, and he was able to, to to look at those. Some of them were charred, uh, and he was able to look at those and excavate a significant uh, stretch of of palisade, and uh, you see some of the charred posts there and he was able to get uh, quite a lot of dating from from this excavation too which suggested that uh, certainly when he, when he interpreted it anyway as, as well the dates were slightly later the dates were about uh, 100 to 90 BC that sort of uh, uh, sort of ballpark figure and he uh, believed that it may have indicated that the, the northern 
part of the, the, the Dorsey, which is possibly less well defined and the southern parts was slightly earlier and the southern parts were an addition, maybe an augmentation to the Dorsey or alternatively that a, 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 an enclosure had been made out of a stretch of a pre-existing stretch of the Black Pigs Dyke by adding on uh, the, the, the southern uh, banks and ditches to, to, and palisades to make up uh, to, to make up a complete uh, enclosed monument. But Oliver Davies' excavations in the uh, southeast uh, of uh, the monument, uh, close to uh, where the Bonds Road passes through uh, the site, uh, established essentially that that was an original gap, that the, the, the Bonds Road, or at least the gap for the Bonds Road, had been there before the rest of the Dorsey uh, was constructed. Uh, and uh, that was very, very important because it showed us that the monument was constructed with an entrance way in mind. Uh, he also found, uh, just where the mouse is here, uh, the remnants of a roundhouse, uh, a roundhouse uh, made of wood, uh, so typical of what you would expect to get in the early medieval period or alternatively in the later prehistoric period. Uh, he did not at that stage of course have uh, access to radiocarbon dating and there are no samples from that, wooden samples or charcoal samples from that house survive. So we don't have anything to be to date it with, to be certain of its, of its age, but uh, he only excavated about two thirds of the house, so one third survives. So there is always the possibility of an excavation in the future, going back to try and, and maybe just get some samples from a very small excavation. Um, just another view of the lidar of the, uh, the southeast corner of the Dorsey at the Bonds Road, and overlaid on it, you can see the location of Oliver. Well, some of Oliver Davies' trenches and also our 2001 uh, excavation trench. Uh, you can, might just be able to see there the area called B, the circularity of the, uh, the roundhouse. And you can also see that there were two palisades uh, dug by Davies II, labelled here as B and C. And he thought that these palisades were probably directing traffic, if you like, uh, through the gap of the Dorsey, because this one particular C seemed to be heading at a slightly oblique angle uh, to the rest of the, the gap, and he thought it was deliberately narrowing down, channeling, if you like, uh, the traffic uh, as it came through uh, the fairly wide gap into a narrower sort of routeway through the interior of the Dorsey. And he may be correct about that. You can also see here uh, our excavation trench from 2002. This is roughly the footprint of McAllister's house and we found evidence for, well, a series of things. We found evidence for two palisades uh, in parallel, you can see them roughly here, I wish I'd actually put that slightly bigger now, but you can see them roughly here. And we also find evidence for uh, a, a ditch and a palisade much, much closer to the road. See, look at these a little bit, yeah, a little bit better detailed now. So you can see the two uh, roughly parallel palisades. Uh, here, and you can see our bank and sort of little palisade uh, uh, trench here, and a couple of just other features which were very shallow and not particularly significant. But these palisade trenches, the three palisade trenches that we have, are substantial. They're not just a little light garden fence, these are substantial palisades. This is how the palisade first appeared. It was originally discovered, this sort of uh, linear uh, dark grey grey-brown feature was first discovered by John O'Keefe uh, of the then of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, HED, now the director of the Discovery Programme and he contacted us at Queen's and we went out with a, with a team, uh, a joint Queen's NAA team directed by myself and Declan Hurl and excavated this over a period of about eight weeks in the summer of 2002. It quite quickly became apparent that this was not just uh, a superficial feature, something like uh, a little uh, a little fence. Uh, as you can see from uh, this photograph, uh, it turned into a pretty uh, major feature. These were large timbers which were put in place and wedged with stones and were running a significant distance across the landscape. Uh, from this photograph you can see uh, that uh, the impressions of the posts uh, were still visible in some parts of the palisade. 
you can see there are four post holes uh, and this, this, this pretty much shows you the size of the, the timbers they're sort of six to eight inch timbers so you know not too much different from a telegraph pole in terms of their size uh, so big heavy timbers closely set together uh, normally if you have a fence of course the uprights are 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 are, are you know, maybe a meter or a meter and a half apart and then there are the the, the, the the spars between them but here everything's bunched up closely together and that's how a policy it different, differentiates from a, a, a fence. Uh, there was significant evidence for burning in fact there were some quite a lot of completely charred timbers uh, it's a beautiful one here we, we, we lifted it whole we hoped to get a dendrochronological date from it because we could see the, uh, the, 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 the the tree rings it was so beautifully so beautifully charred and so firm and, and intact uh, and there was an attempt made by Dave Brown of the, uh, the then School of Geography and Archaeology now of the Natural and Built Environment Archaeology of Queens to uh, to, to, to date this uh, using dendrochronology but he wasn't able to get uh, there was too much warping uh, and he, he, he did get he did I think he got three different dates one of which he said we would really like but he wasn't going to tell us it because he couldn't depend on it because the amount of warping in the uh, the wood and that's 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 fair enough uh, this is another picture of a different charred uh, charred timber uh, and what's really interesting about this is uh, we puzzled over this for a long time and maybe the results from the 2019 excavation have maybe enlightened us, uh, enlightened us about this slightly. But this timber uh, didn't seem to go to the, 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 the bottom of the, uh, the bottom of the Palisade Trench uh, and the burning it didn't seem to go the whole way down and in this particular location. And we wondered about that and we thought it might be a repair timber which then had been burnt down a second and a second occasion and then we weren't sure maybe then, maybe it just, maybe combustion had only went so far down and the rest of the, the timber had rotted and there was quite a lot of debate about this and we never came to a completely uh, settled position on it although it did look like the base of the the timber you know was shaped to be hammered into the ground it did seem to be pointed but you know you, there are all sorts of uh, processes of decay and you know, whether the, the, the exterior the, or the interior of the the, the, the the timber had you know sort of managed to burn with that effect differentially how it rotted at the base and stuff like that so we never came to a settled position on that but it did alert us to the possibility there was something just a little more complex happening in what archaeologists call the stratigraphy that's the sort of the, the build up of the soil layers and the interrelationships of the different phases of construction deconstruction and reconstruction that go on in a complex monument that's maybe been in place for a hundred or maybe several hundred years. So it, it, it alerted us to some possibilities that have sort of been working away at the backs of our minds for the, the, the past nearly two decades. Uh, this is the trench that was closest to the road, so I'm just showing with my mouse here where the trench is closest to the road, and you can see that it had a, a, a shallow, probable roadside ditch, and we got a, we got a, a, a radiocarbon date of the 4th to 2nd century BC from this. And we also have here a series of uh, sockets for, for, for timbers, also closely set together in the manner of a policy. And I thought I should have better vertical photograph in here, but uh, I suppose that does give the, 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 the idea of the relationship of the, 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 the timbers to, to the, what appears to be the roadside gully or roadside shallow ditch. Uh, these are the, the, the radiocarbon dates that we got from the 2002 excavation, along with some other radiocarbon dates which have been obtained from other uh, excavations, and at the bottom, uh, the uh, dendrochronological dates, uh, which Chris Lynn obtained from the north rampart and from the, uh, the, the, the south uh, west of the monument. And you can see there Chris Lynn's dates, I'm just going to with the mouse, the two northern ramparts will. Uh, 135 minus 135 BC plus or minus 9 and 150 BC plus or minus 9. So let's say those are in the you know 130 to 160 sort of potential range. And then these other three dates from the, the southwest, which are really in the well 89 to 96 plus or minus 9. So let's say that's 80 to 100 BC. So there seems to be a little bit of a gap, you know, maybe a few decades gap between. The, the dates at the top and the dates at the, the bottom uh, 
western corner of, of the monument. Is that just chance because of the the, uh, the, the, the the timbers that were found? Does it show that there was a certain dynamic nature to the construction of the monument? One part constructed first and another part constructed later. Or does it show that the relationship of the Palisades to the rest of the monument? Because of course these two from the North Round part were not Palisades, they were timbers found in the ditch. Does it show that the relation of the Palisades to the rest of the monument is maybe a little more complex uh, than we first realised? But the interesting thing, looking at the, the broad, let's not focus on the specific, but looking at the broad trends between the various different dates from all of the excavations at the Dorsey, the Dunedrum Sna, and the couple of dates also from the Black Pigs Dyke, we can see that they're all in this sort of, well, 400 BC to roughly the time of Christ. And also, a lot of these dates were obtained from uh, ordinary charcoal, or, or as an unidentified charcoal, or alternative from charcoal that we know to have been oak charcoal. And one of the things about charcoal dates is, especially if they're from a long-lived tree, if you, like, like oak for instance, or there are other long-lived trees too, that if you can't tell if the, the, the piece of wood comes from the outer layers, it's possible that the piece of wood, the piece of charcoal, could come from the core of the tree. And it potentially could be two or maybe even three hundred years later than a piece of wood that you might date from the outside of the tree. So when, when using either unidentified charcoal uh, or alternatively charcoal that you know to come from a uh, a, a, a long-lived tree like alder or oak or something like that. You always have to be careful, if you don't know what part of the tree it comes from, you always have to be careful of the fact that there could be, in fact it's quite likely, that there's going to be some sort of offset uh, caused by what archaeologists call old wood effect after uh, Richard Warner's sort of naming of this in the late 80s when he, when he, he, he quantified the, 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 the problem, if you like, uh, for, for radiocarbon dating. There are a few dates here which are, well, one date which isn't vulnerable to that is the roasting pit, because it's from a charred hazelnut shell. Uh, and the roasting pit, uh, well, charred hazelnut shells have only got one year's growth, obviously, on them. So the roasting pit date can be taken as reliably dating uh, a, a feature which was up against part of the palisade, a roasting pit where somebody had a meal one day. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit later than, than most of the other dates from, from the Dorsey that are obtained from charcoal, but it's roughly in the range of the dates that are obtained from dendrochronology. So that probably gives you an idea that at least part of the date ranges for these dates uh, from the Dorsey and from the Black Pig State, which are just from charcoal, are probably a little bit older than the actual things they're dating. So just to be, something to be aware of. Uh, this is the location of our 2019 trench. And one of the things about our excavation, of course, I'm just going to go back a couple of slides, from uh, 2002 is that we had detected a series of palisades, one, two, three palisades and a shallow ditch, which appeared to run parallel to the modern Bonds Road. And we have a gap, which is an ancient gap, we had a tradition in the area that the Bonds Road was an old coach road. Uh, also possibly it was said a uh, local tradition, uh, part of the, the, the our branch enemy of the Schlee Midlöcher heading for Armagh, which of course local tradition uh, said that uh, Brian Baru had been, 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 been carried on in his, in his funeral cortege going to Armagh Cathedral. And uh, so these things taken together, I mean, the, 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 the obvious uh, assumption our conclusion to draw is that the Bonds Road is an ancient Iron Age road that is running through the Dorsey and of course that, that may be the reason why the Dorsey has this name because it is a gateway along that, along that road. But to be certain about that we really needed to establish that, well, if we, well, how could we be certain about it? We can't dig up the Bonds Road, not easily anyway. That requires a major operation, we have to obviously get lots of permissions but also we have to close a road which people use on a daily basis for a significant period of time and it's quite a big excavation it could involve a lot of people for many weeks and uh, you know require a lot of resources and permissions and things like that but an easier way to at least well add to the the, the add evidence to the uh, to, to, to the problem or bring extra evidence to the problem would be to carry out another excavation and see if we could identify uh, 
palisades on the opposite side of the road. And if we palisades either side of the road, then it suggests that this linear thing that's running through the monument is of significance, it is a thing. And that's exactly what we decided to do. So the first thing that happened was Siobhan McDermott, and she may have shown you the geophysical plots, uh, I think, uh, last night. Siobhan McDermott did a geophysical survey. And the geophysical survey clearly showed a geophysical anomaly running down uh, alongside the Bonds Road, heading for the, the entranceway into the Dorsey. So we selected our trench based on her geophysical survey, and that's the blue line, and that's where we dug. Uh, and well, almost immediately upon taking the sod off, uh, we hit uh, this. You can probably see, if you look carefully, that there is light brown soil uh, on either side of a band of darker brown soil. And as soon as we saw that, and to anybody that had been there in 2002, this said Palisade in capital letters. So our tre initial trench, which is running uh, left-right in this photograph, uh, we decided, uh, we got permission to from the uh, Historic Environment Division, uh, we, uh, we, 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 we requested and got permission to widen out our trench to make it a cruciform trench rather than a linear trench to be able to catch a few metres uh, of this uh, uh, palisade and, and you know, have enough room to excavate the stretch of it properly. Uh, as we uh, went down into the palisade it became clear almost immediately that there was quite a lot of charcoal within its fill. And guess what? We weren't too far down into it until we started to see the shapes of uh, palisade posts much like we did in uh, in 2002. But then something odd started to happen. We had the bases of the palisade posts, and they weren't that deep. And then we continued to dig, and we went through that horizon, uh, went down below the bases of the palisade pipes that we could see, the post pipes, as archaeologists call them, that we could see, the impressions, the shadows of the palisades. We could see the charcoal of where they'd been burnt. But then there was another layer below them, and it was still fill of the palisade. So we kept digging. And we come down upon a second set of uh, impressions of post pipes. So we had a first set, which if you look at this photograph, is roughly defined by this charcoal. We had a second set, which was also associated with the spread of charcoal. And then, low, first set, second set, we went down farther again. And we had a third set of post pipes, all in slightly different positions than each other and all well, substantial posts, all associated with a spread of charcoal of their own. And, well, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty clear uh, once we sort of saw it and teased it out. And it was Heather, of course, Heather Montgomery, who first saw us, had the Eureka moment and says, do you know what? We've got more than one uh, set of palisades here. This palisade has been rebuilt on more than one occasion. And she was absolutely correct. There's no way you could look at the stratigraphy and say that this was a single unitary uh, structure which had been put in place and then burnt down. Uh, it, the, simply the stratigraphy did not support that. It had to have been burnt down, cleaned out and re rebuilt, re-burnt down and cleaned out again and rebuilt on at least three occasions. And of course it could be a lot more than three occasions because you only have to clean it out once really well to get rid of all the evidence, effectively, of the previous clean-out. So we, we say three's a minimum, but it, you know, it could be five, ten, a dozen times it could have been rebuilt and burnt down. We have no idea about that, except to know that it's happened several times. And you now can sort of uh, see, although it was only a fairly small stretch, we did have three metres of it, so you can sort of extrapolate from that, that it is pretty much running parallel to the three uh, stretches of policy that we got in 2002. And it's roughly heading for this roundhouse, what, which uh, Davies called his guardhouse, that he got in 1938. And it's not too far off the two bits of policy it's that actually run through uh, the Dorsey Gateway uh, itself. So, very exciting result. Uh, we haven't yet got any radiocarbon dates from that. And a uh, number of reasons for that. We take our time a little bit, teasing out what's the best way to do it, because uh, there are, well, there are potentially three phases of, of uh, 
three phases of activity to detect there. And that's not an easy thing to do in radiocarbon terms. It may be that all we can do is just simply say there are three phases of activity within a sort of broad period of use of the Dorsey, or we might potentially be able to refine that a little more. And that's something which we're, we're going to try and undertake in the not too distant future. See if we can tease out a little more uh, chronological uh, uh, chronological sort of resolution by a couple of little mathematical techniques and a couple of stratigraphical techniques and careful choice of uh, dating material. But that's a, that's a, that's a project that's for, the, for, the, for the near future. Uh, so what do we know uh, after we've done these excavations in the Dorsey? Well, we know that it was, well, constructed probably 2nd century BC to 1st century BC, that sort of period. We now know that the Dorsey is pretty much a continuous monument. Uh, it was not uh, just two or three stretches of bank which have been the dots have been joined together by by later antiquarians. Uh, it was it was uh, much more much much more complete than that. We know that there was at least one original break in the monument where the bond showed enters the monument, and quite possibly two. And though those two uh, entranceways going into the monument do look a bit like the Dunedrum Snar, to be honest with you. Uh, although the Dunedrum Snars have, you probably notice, I don't want to look back to the, the, the slide now, but you probably notice they were slightly winged or flanged. They had a sort of a, uh, uh, an entrance way uh, protruding beyond the, the, the embankments. But it's quite possible that Palisades could have done the same uh, in the Dorsey. Uh, we know that there is local tradition of an ancient road there. Uh, and uh, this all makes sense, really, of the Palisades running either side of it. Uh, the ancient roadway tradition, the fact that we now know there is a break in the monument, what we've known for some time, break in the monument, that is an original uh, break in the monument. And what's really interesting now, and it, it ties into what we found in 2002, it makes sense of what we saw in 2002, these palisades are not single phase structures. These palisades were built, destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt. And that is... If the takeaway from that is that the biggest takeaway, I think, almost from this excavation, what is going on with this process? Why would you do that? Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a wee minute or two, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, 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 the roads themselves and what were the significance of the roads. And I, know you, the, the, I don't want to talk too much about this because I know it was talked about last night, uh, but, you know, the, 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 the Al's the Four Masters say the roads are 1st century AD. Uh, and tie them to the birth of Colin of the Hundred Battles. Uh, that's that's fine. Uh, our information suggests there may be first or second century BC, but I think we can. We, we don't need to fall out with the Isles of the Four Masters over a slight discrepancy like that. It certainly shows that uh, that ancient Irish history considered them to be in the same ballpark in the great, in the great scheme of things that our radiocarbon dates uh, do. And of course, the Isles of the Four Masters and other. Uh, uh, Historical Irish sources tell of these of these uh, five great roads radiating from Tara across uh, the landscape. Uh, the interesting thing is, all of these tell of them roads being discovered, if you like. They're not made, they're discovered. And there are hints uh, from all of the different sources uh, that the discovery of these roads implies something something earlier. It's I think that actually one of the Shanika's poems, there's one which isn't published, which Gregory Bordenyenko talks quite a bit about, and um, it suggests it's the rediscovery of these roads, that there had been more ancient roads, which I don't know, have been abandoned maybe, and then rediscovered or, or, or re-cleared, uh, resurfaced perhaps, uh, in the, 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 the sort of the con of the Hundred Battles period. So whether that is a reference to uh, restoration or revival of 1st, 2nd century BC roads, or whether it refers to a much earlier period, uh, is uh, anybody's guess without a, a lot further work. Uh, yeah, and one of the interesting things is that these roads, uh, these roads uh, are, are, are all described in, in quite a few of the different poems as having road guardians associated with them, uh, ancient armies, ancient soldiers, demons, ghosts associated with them. Uh, they're 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 not uh, they're active. I suppose people like to say nowadays that was the way they perceived of them. They were places of spiritual uh, uh, risk as well as, uh, as as well as physical risk. Uh, 
and the stretch that we're particularly talking about the road that we particularly are interested in, the Slim and Lurkra. Again, I don't want to go into about too much of this, uh, but uh, again, uh, it's Midlucher is, is is the person who discovers the Slim and Lurkra, uh, and he's an, an, you know, an important sort of. Uh, under under Lord of the King of Tara and his thing is to bring pigs to Tara each year at Samhain. Uh, and the pig of course ties in very much with the, the, the pig motifs and the folklore uh, of the Black Pig Stake. Uh, and he, I think that the, some of the poems describe him driving the pigs in front of him, creating the road as he goes uh, to Tara at Samhain. Uh, Grigory Bordignanko, again a great a scholar of uh, Old Irish notes that the form of the Old Irish word pig uh, can also mean uh, a demonic animal. and uh, So there might be some tie up there between the pig and the, the worm ditch, sort of names that get given to the black pig steak as well as the black pig steak itself. And uh, so uh, Midlurker clears the road and clears it of phantoms and ancient armies and things like that, driving in a sort of Lord of the Rings manner, uh, driving along the road to Tara. The road of, of ancient armies. Oh, big fault. Uh, so, the boundaries and the roads, if they are boundaries, seem to be linked to some sort of an organic whole. Uh, there is, I think, we can begin to see uh, uh, the, the beginnings of a link here between myth and archaeology in some of these monuments. There, there doesn't seem to be any doubt about that. Uh, but the Palisades, again, the Palisades. Why are the Palisades burnt? What is going on with the Palisades? Why are they burnt and why are they reconstructed on several, possibly numerous occasions? I think people used to think when they saw burnt Palisades, they thought, well, that's been an attack. You know, people assumed that the Dorsey and the Black Pig State and things like that were primarily defensive structures. And you know, the sort of idea of all the sort of braves are coming with flaming arrows and stuff like that, and sort of firing them at the Palisades and in the manner of a, a cowboy movie of the, the 1940s or 50s and it going up in, in, in flames and been burned away. The problem there is, is that big oak Palisades are not sort of thatched houses or light fences for that matter. They're big oak palisades and they're actually really, really hard to burn down. Now, a few years ago, Harry Welsh and some others from the, the, the Ulster Archaeological Society you know, tried to burn a palisade. They built a sort of short stretch of palisade and they tried to burn it. And the thing is that they found that it was bloody hard to burn. You know, it's not just a couple of fire lighters and a wee bit of kindling. You, need, you, know, you, you actually need to focus on keeping this palisade uh, combusting over a, a long period of time before you get it to burn. It isn't a casual act. You're not going to do that just coming and sliding uh, the, the, the sort of monument in a, in a quick act as part of a cavalry or part of a revenge attack and then clearing off before you know the, the, the main body of the main body of uh, uh, of Ulster arrive and, 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 and sort of uh, give give chase. Uh, it's not something that you casually do. If you're going to burn a palisade, you're going to. It's a purposeful act. You intend to burn the palisade. You keep it stoked and you keep it burning for hours or possibly days. And of course, what we saw in that photograph of the completely charred palisade is what you would expect if you were charcoal making. It's not what you would expect if you're just you know casually burning something. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, and running away, that must have been tended and kept simmering, if you like, and simmering, smouldering uh, for hours or possibly even days to have reduced that to charcoal like that. And yet, that's not just one point on the Dorsey. That's something which we find in both Palisades of the Dorsey, of all three Palisades of the Dorsey, on the the west side. We also seem to find it on the Palisade on the Dorsey of the east side. We see it in some of the sections of Palisades that Chris Lynn has excavated. We have seen it in the Palisades that have recently been reported, well, first reported on by Aidan Walsh in, 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 in the 80s, uh, after the excavations, and most recently in the Aidan Walsh and Colleen O'Driscoll book that's just been published, that their Palisades are completely combusted too. So what's going on here? Someone seems to be deliberately burning Palisades, and that is an inherently strange thing to want to do. But what's even more strange is that they don't seem to do it once, they seem to do it multiple times. The evidence from the Palisades at the Dorsey is that there is more than one act of Palisade building, burning, rebuilding and burning at least three and possibly more. And that is something that needs explanation. I've wondered at this quite a lot. 
Again, you could see it as a really serious act to demonstrate dominance by one group over another. In other words, we burnt your palisade and we didn't just we didn't just scorch it, we burnt it until it was completely reduced to ash. That is a major statement to make and it requires a significant amount of time and it's really showing dominance and it happened on more than one occasion. That's one possibility. The other possibility is, is that the burning of the palisade is a deliberate act, but it's a deliberate act of ritual. And one of the things that happens when you burn something that's a bit like cremation or a burnt offering that you, 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 you know, in the Bible, that sort of idea, is that when you burn something, you commit it to the spiritual world, essentially. Uh, and deliberately destroying something, committing them to this by the, committing them to the spiritual world, is something that we find in the Irish archaeological record all the time. It's been suggested for Neolithic houses. It happens with cremation burials, of course, and also it's the the the, uh, the the grave goods which are placed uh, along, into the onto the pyre with cremation burials. They are being committed to the other world by an act of combustion. And the idea that uh, by burning a palisade you create something for the other world. Uh, a defence in the other world, if you like, perhaps a defence against the armies of the dead that are recorded in some of these ancient tales uh, about the other world. You know, that's another possibility that there's some deliberate ritual act, maybe to provide protection, maybe to keep the unwanted off the road or keep the unwanted on the road, the spiritual unwanted. And in that respect, it's a little bit maybe analogous to what some people suggest henges are for, which is keeping spiritual entities contained within a, a reversed bank and ditch where the where the, the, the ditch is on the inside and the banks on the outside and you effectively keep constrained everything that's inside it. So it could have a similar uh, meaning, if not necessarily the same physicality as a, a kind of a hedge. It could be a hedge for, 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 for linear earthworks and for roads. And again, the fact that the policy, the burnt policy, appears to be occurring both on stretches of the Black Pig's Dyke and also inside the Dorsey flanking the earthworks and also inside the Dorsey flanking the roads or the road does seem to be tying categorically these three types of monument together. The Iron Age enclosure, the Iron Age linear monument and the road running through the Iron Age enclosure. Uh, I don't want to say too much about Colin O'Driscoll Indian and Walsh is a rather very good book uh, because I think it's just published and uh, I've been lucky enough to, to read it and I think it's very good. I think it's well worth a read actually. Uh, they do, as I say, cast doubt on the idea that the Black Pig State was ever continuous. They might be right. We need to test that. We need more LIDAR, essentially. They have found a late Bronze Age settlement at Scotstown straddling the Black Pig State. That's really interesting. It's not entirely clear whether the Black Pig State uh, is contemporary with it. I think they, on balance of probabilities, think that the Black Pig State's there. Uh, the stratigraphy kind of supports that. Uh, but uh, again, uh, more survey work, geophysical survey and excavation along the line of the Black Pig State. We'll see if other things could, if other similar settlements are found along the line of it. And they make a really fascinating suggestion, which is really needs a close examination and following up by archaeologists. They have made the suggestion that the Dorsey and the Dunlop from Sna and possibly other stretches of linear earthworks where it's not completely straight may be parts of what archaeologists call obida. Now, obida are a class of monuments found across uh, Bert Colbus, Celtic uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, they're, 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 I suppose, a primitive sort of town. A typical obidum is uh, built on a, a sort of a raised area, uh, uh, enclosed with earthworks, very often with some sort of road going into it or through it. And it functions as a sort of a, a fairly sophisticated uh, late prehistoric settlement, uh, market town, that sort of thing, uh, central place really for a, 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 an Iron Age lordship. Some of them, especially in the Roman era and, and the ones that are closer to the classical world do it as well in the prehistoric era, become really very sophisticated. I mean, you go to places like the Hunneberg in Germany and they're building sort of Greek style sort of uh, mud brick ramparts and stuff like that and all sorts of outworks and sophisticated entranceways. And, 
and uh, well-planned interiors of the of, 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 of street grid almost. Uh, ones, however, that are uh, less less close to the Roman world are, are, are a little more a little more informal. And there's uh, recently there have been some work in in, in uh, looking at Opata in Britain and in, in France, which has suggested that there's a sort of a a, a semi-urban Opata a sort of a less intense version of an obita. And a few of them have been excavated and actually some of them do look rather like the Dorsey and the Dunedrum Snow. Some of them uh, are on like the Dunedrum Snow are, are kind of an, on promontories uh, defined by rivers with just one set of earthworks and a number of well defined entranceways going in. Uh, they do have settlement within them, but the settlement within them is not is is, is not really Dense, dense urban settlement. It's maybe a few dozen or a few hundred buildings stretched over the hundreds of, of acres of the enclosed interior. Uh, and uh, some of them also uh, look very similar to the Dorsey, with uh, uh, no necessary, not much in the way of uh, being defined by rivers, but much more being defined by embankments of varying heights. In some occasion, very, uh, some very impressive embankments, in other parts, uh, much less impressive embankments, suggesting that defence was not as important as the concept of enclosure and the concept of impressing people at certain parts by the, the, the size of the enclosures. To be honest, I don't know if the Dorsey and the Dunedrosna are obita. I don't entirely yet buy it, but I think it's a damn good idea and I think it needs testing. And again, the way to test it is with, well, we've got the LIDAR for the Dorsey, we've got the LIDAR for the Dunedrosna. We need to do uh, wide-scale geophysics on both of those sites, uh, multiple uh, types of geophysics, uh, magnetometry, uh, resistivity uh, as well, uh, and also possibly aerial, different types of aerial survey using different wavelengths of light uh, to detect different types of, of, of submerged archaeological features, and we need that followed up with excavation. And that will really uh, be the only way to answer that question. And generally, we need to look more widely at all of the near earthworks of, of Ireland with more LIDAR, more geophysics and more excavation. And we need to take a very close look at the plethora of early medieval Irish texts that there are, which might, when looked at again, uh, give us some nuanced uh, ideas as to what might be going on here. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, it was an excellent project, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, the, 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 the Ring of Gullion partnership, uh, absolutely fantastic. We got great support uh, from you. You were brilliant. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, it, it, it. It was a pleasure to be there. I'd like to, to thank very much the people as well of South Armagh who were, were full of enthusiasm the whole way through the project. Uh, some of our open days were so well attended and the thing I really like about working in the area is that you get so many good questions, you know. People know their folklore, people know their monuments really well in the area. And uh, we get so much good information, uh, only some of which I've, I've had the time to follow up on. Uh, but really good information uh, from, from, from many different local people. Uh, and it was a great, great project, really, really enjoyed it. And I just hope that at some stage we can get back and do some further work uh, in the area. Okay, uh, I'll hopefully be with you physically in a few moments if you want to ask some uh, questions. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you all soon. Right, bye-bye.